will live for him in Jesus name Amen. and every need of our lives will fulfill Amen. those desires deep and high tonight the Lord will fulfill for our lives Amen. give me a good church Amen, Amen. let's pray together Father we thank you for this hour of study thank you for the ministration already Lord we're praying the desire to live for you and to live for your glory and to receive all the blessings of the Lord your grant your children in Jesus name we pray for our newcomers we pray for our old timers we pray for our members and invitees we pray oh Lord today you'll do something definite in every life in Jesus name open our eyes of understanding that you will behold and see wondrous things out of your word tonight in Jesus name bless your people Lord in Jesus name we pray Amen. God bless you can see that we're coming to John chapter 13 for the benefit of those who are joining us for the first time we have actually started from chapter 1 and we're making progress we're now in chapter 13 I want to tell you something about this a chapter and the next uh, four chapters that is chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. It will surprise you that the content of these five chapters are only recorded by John the Beloved. And these materials, these chapters, they are special and sublime. And the Lord Jesus Christ has given us something very, very great in these chapters. As we look at the one we're looking at today, chapter 13, we're reading from verse 1 all through to verse 17. The Lord is very close to the betrayal and the crucifixion. The disciples were more concerned about their own position of supremacy. And because they saw their condition, that's why we have what we're looking at today is the washing of the saints' feet. But actually the title of tonight is Christ's heavenly virtue of humble servanthood. There's a lot there. Christ's heavenly virtue of humble servanthood. And let's see the condition of the children of uh, the disciples of Christ before we actually delve into this uh, chapter. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 20 and I'm reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 20 we're looking at verse 20 so you know the background and you know why Jesus did what he did and the lesson and the uh, virtue the Lord is uh, bringing to our lives. Matthew chapter 20 verse 20 it says uh, then came to him uh, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshipping him uh, and desiring a certain thing uh, of him and he said unto her what wilt thou? Said she says unto him uh, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. He says unto them, and he says unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of the cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten, you know, there were twelve uh, apostles, twelve disciples, the two went to Jesus with their mother. One wanted to sit on this side and the other on the other side. And the rest of them, the ten, uh, when they heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them uh, unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. There had been a conflict and argument as to who is the greatest, who is going to be greater of all the apostles. 
And uh, because of that, uh, John and James quickly went to the Lord Jesus Christ and they wanted a place there and a place there. And the other ten were angry. They were indignant and they were wrathful against the two. And so Jesus had to call them and he had to tell them that the kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of the world. That's why he said, it shall not be so like that among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Who Whosoever will be great or be number one, let him be the last. Let him be the servant that is serving others. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And that's what Jesus uh, taught them. But it appeared that the lesson he had taught them, or the teaching and the doctrine of this humility, had not sunk deep into their hearts. And so he now did what he did. I'm reading to you from John now, from chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let's read from verse 4. He rises up from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and guarded himself. That was the duty or responsibility of a servant. And now he acted like a servant. And he showed them what their attitude should be. Look at verse 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was gathered. And then we come to verse 13. He says in verse 13, You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And that's uh, what he wanted to pass across to them. He washed their feet. Although Peter was surprised, and all the other disciples too must have been surprised, that Jesus was carrying out the duty of of his servant and the duty of his slave uh, in the house. And yet he was uh, teaching them something they needed to get. And I pray that every one of us will get this tonight in Jesus' name. In this uh, passage then that we're looking at today from verse 1 to verse 17, he taught them this virtue of humility by example washing their feet and then he told them uh, they should do that one to another as i told you the topic we're looking at today is a christ heavenly virtue of humble servanthood and we're dividing into three parts number one the condescension and willing servanthood of the master the condescension is the master, is the Lord, is the King of kings, and is the Savior, and is the shepherd of the sheep. And yet, he condescended, he went down, and he searched them, even though he was the master. Point number one, the condescension and willing servitude of the master. Point number two, our consecration and willing submission to the master. When he came to Peter and he wanted to uh, wash uh, Peter's feet, it's like uh, Peter did not want to submit and surrender. But eventually when he explained to him, uh, he surrendered. And I pray that the virtue of surrender and the virtue of submission will be in all our lives in Jesus' name. Number two, our consecration and willing submission to the master. Point number three now is the call to willing self-sacrifice like the master. The call to willing self-sacrifice like the master. We come to number one. As we come to number one, we're looking at the condescension and willing servitude of the master. We're coming to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 from verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them 
unto the end. You see the time when this event happened, that is the washing of the feet of the disciples, it was when Jesus knew that his hour was come. You know, many times in, the, in John, as we have been reading, you say, my time has not come, my hour has not come. But now he says, he knew that his hour had come. What does that mean? This was the very week of the betrayer, the very week of the crucifixion. It was about to go to the Father. That's what we learn in verse 1, to depart from this world and to get to the Father. And we're told that even in that condition, he loved his own and he loved them to the end. If he looked at each of them, if you know what, they, what Matthew, Mark, and Luke had recorded, he took them for prayer and they were to pray with him. They couldn't even pray with him and they were sleeping and yet he loved them he loved them to the very end even at this time they were arguing be between themselves who is going to be the greatest among us and yet he loved them to the very end and Jesus is being an example for us he's telling us that whatever our brethren have done whatever our brethren are doing however immature some people may be or weak some people may be if we're going to be like Christ and thank God we're going to be like Christ Oh, to be like him. Oh, to be like him. Blessed Savior will be like him in Jesus' name. That whatever the condition of our brethren may be, we love them. And it is not just a one-day love. It's not just a one-week love. It's, just a sh it's not a brief love. He loved them to the end and will keep loving the brethren to the very end in Jesus' name. At the end, look at verse 2. It says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son, uh, the son, uh, Simon's son, to betray him. He was looking at, uh, si at uh, Judas Iscariot and he knew that he was going to betray him. What if you knew you had a problem, you had a challenge, you can see the problem right in front of you, would you still have the mind of loving the children of God? You know, sometimes in a house fellowship, that's the reason why some house fellowship are not thriving, some house fellowships are not uh, growing. You know why? I have my own problem and then I'm going to leave the house fellowship I don't have a job, I don't have this I don't have that, I'm even having some challenge in my body and they want me to go and leave the house fellowship, I want somebody to minister to me also, you see Jesus was not thinking about the betrayer, about the difficulty about the challenges, he still loved the people, I pray that that same love will come to every heart will be in every house fellowship and will be in our local churches in Jesus name you see how amen is very weak? He will do it for us in Jesus' name. Hey, look, at, look at verse 3. It says, uh, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. He had given all things to his hand. And then he says, and that he was to come, he was come from God and he went to God. You see, the connection of all this is that he was a man, he was uh, the God of authority, he was a king in authority because the Father, Heavenly Father had given all things into his hand and yet was going to do something surprising. He was going to go low. He was going to descend low. He was going to condescend. He was going to wash the feet of the, of the disciples and yet these are the cries of authority. Have you ever thought about, uh, you know, maybe in your place of work, you are high, in your school, you are high, in your community, you are high, and you are so high up there, then you come to the church and you're sitting by the side of somebody who does not uh, even marry to be like you know a potter in your place of work and yet because of the love of Christ and because of the humility of Christ we relate with one another we are brothers and sisters we're not looking at I'm high he is low and far and he is behind but we show this love to one another that's exactly what Jesus Christ was trying to pass across here that there'll be no discrimination nation and there will be no difference between up and down high and low men and women but we all love one another in the love of Christ and it says he has committed all things to his son and let me show you this this kind of love we're looking at John chapter 15 verse 13 John chapter 15 verse 13 it says greater love than this Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
for his friends. He was calling the disciples his friends. You know, he is God and they are men. He is master and they were his disciples and followers. And he is, they are actually his servants because he sent them forth to go and preach. And uh, these uh, servants and these followers, he called them friends. He called them friends. He made himself to be on the same platform with them. That's why he took uh, the basin and that's why he took the water and he washed the disciples' feet and is teaching us a lifetime lesson. By the grace of God, this virtue of Christ will be in our hearts in Jesus' name. Uh, look at uh, John chapter John chapter 3 and I'm reading here from verse 35. John chapter 3, we're reading from verse 35. The authority that uh, the Father had given to Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. In verse 35 it says, uh, the Father loveth the Son and has given all things into his hand. All things into his son. You're a believer, you're a child of God. If you add all the land in your community, how humble can you still be? If you add all the money in a particular bank, how humble will you still be? If you add, you know, the authority and the glory and people are exalting you and they are praising you and singing your praise, how humble will you be? That's what Jesus is teaching us, that even though we're high, even though we possess a lot of things, even though we have some qualities, even though we might have real authority and position we will not carry that on our faces we will not carry that on our shoulders the way we walk and the way we interact with other people we are not saying come and see me how great I am and then before people even they, you know get to know us we say ah, you are looking at me like that and you are greeting me like that can I tell you who I am can I tell you where I am coming from that's what Jesus is discouraging that's what Jesus is telling us that although I have all power I have all authority yet I'm going to wash the same speed and I pray that this virtue I will possess I say so I will possess you will possess in Jesus name uh, let, let's come back to John chapter 13 John chapter 13 uh, I'm reading from verses 4 and 5 it says he riseth from supper they were all eating together he riseth from supper and he laid, his, uh, laid, he laid aside his garments and he took a towel and guarded himself he had never done this before them the master have been watching him what's the lord trying to do today and what's the master trying to do today because he took the towel and they were all sitting down he didn't tell them to go and help me fetch the water there look at the spiva after he had poured the water into a basin who poured the water into the basin he wasn't sitting like you know, a master on a high seat, on a high tower. And he said, you go and uh, take that basin. You go and pour that water. You go and do that. But he did it himself. He was trying to show those disciples that you already you're feeling like a master. You're feeling that the Lord. You're feeling as if you're exalted above. Everybody come down. And as the Lord is teaching us this practical lesson, it will sink deep into every heart in Jesus' name. And then it says in that verse 5, And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was guarded. And uh, oh, what's that kind of uh, responsibility? How do you understand somebody stooping down or bending low and then washing the feet of somebody else? Let me show you for Samuel chapter 25. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're reading from verse 41. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 41, so that you understand the responsibility or the duty of uh, somebody washing another person's feet is the responsibility of a servant, of a slave, of a lowly person, of a humble person. Look at verse 41, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Are you there? It says, and she rose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant 
to wash the feet. You see that? It's the servant. It's the work of a slave. It's the responsibility of a slave. And it is the duty of a slave. Let your handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. It wasn't even saying, uh, let me be a servant to wash their feet. David said, I'm not qualified for that. What I can do is that I can wash the feet of your servants. Which tells us that uh, this uh, person that said this here, uh, Abigail, was uh, somebody humble. And that same humility the Lord is expecting uh, that we will have. Come back to John. In John chapter 13, reading here from verse verse 13 John chapter 13 verse 13 he called me master and lord and you say well for so I am now the fact that uh, we're humble does not mean that we don't understand who we are you're a child of God I'm a child of God you're bent down to wash another person's feet that is in humility that does console the fact that you're a child of God you are a manager in your place of work praise the Lord but when you do the service like Jesus did in humility that doesn't mean you are not a manager anymore you're a father you're a mother that does not mean you're not a father you are not a mother just because you are washing somebody's feet that is because you are humble you know your position you know your position you know your authority you know what you have and yet you lay that aside you lay all that quality aside and then you wash another person's feet that's not the literal thing it's not the literal thing we're talking about is the picture of of humility and I pray that God will give that to us look at verse 14 if I then your Lord and master have washed your feet ye ought also to wash one another's feet he said I'm your Lord I'm your master and I bench down and I bench low and I washed your feet all the dirt in your feet I didn't say where did you go where do you why is this mud on your feet and why do you have this or that? Even though he didn't ask any question, he said, I washed your feet. And he says, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Let's stop here for a moment. Does that mean that, you know, uh, maybe next Thursday when we have a meeting, we'll say now we'll bring bowls of water and then I'm washing your feet and you are washing somebody's feet and somebody is saying, it. why are we doing the Oh, because we learned on Monday that Jesus said, I've washed your feet, therefore wash one another's feet. No, not at all. You don't find that in the Acts of the Apostles. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. It's not there. Chapter 2, when those 3,000 were converted and they all came together they even took the lord's supper but you know there was no washing of feet and then you look at chapter four when those people are combined thousands of them they didn't come together on a thursday on a friday on a sunday and wash one another's feet look at paul the apostle he came to join them now in chapter nine and he is okay are you really born again you've been high over there now come down and you must wash the feet of the rest of the people it wasn't something they were to practice literally it was the humility the virtue of Jesus Christ he wanted to pass across to them and he's saying that this is not for Thursday this is not for Sunday this is for every day I said this is for every day that you look at your brother and you're able to bend low you look at your sister and you're able to bend low and there is no sign of pride there's no sign of superiority there's no sign of supremacy there's no sign of I'm better than you are and you are lower than I'm it's a virtue that we practice every day and the Lord will do it in our lives in Jesus name Hey, look at what he's saying here. He's telling us in the Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He gives us the interpretation in Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse, uh, let me read from verse 2. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 2. You see what the Lord is saying. He said, fulfill, my, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, uh, having the same love. <clears throat> being of one accord and of one mind you see when jesus washed their feet he didn't look up and say okay that's nathaniel i think i need to pass over you 
that is uh, Philip. No, I, I think I'm going to the next person. He just did it uniformly for everybody. And he's saying that there's no discrimination. It is not a selective service. It is not that that's so and so. I'm going to be humble. That's such and such. I'm going to be humble. Because of who she is and because of who he is, I'm going to bend low. There's no discrimination. Look at this. Fulfill ye my joy. And that she be like my dead. And it says, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind is to everyone. May God give us the grace. It says in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife of being glory. You see those uh, disciples, they have been having strife together. I'm better than you are. I'm greater than you are. I came before you and I have done more before you. I went to the Mount of Transfiguration. Were you there? I walked on the sea. Did you do that? That's what he was trying to counsel in their midst. That's why it says there, let nothing be done through strife or being glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Learn the lesson. I said, yeah, have you had the lesson? It says, let each one esteem others better than themselves. What does that mean? It says, there is something I can do that maybe you cannot do. But I must understand you. There is something you can do that I cannot do. You feel a place in the kingdom of God that I cannot feel. Maybe I'm feeling a place too in the kingdom of God that you cannot feel. I'm looking at you and I exalt your position. I appreciate your position. You're looking at me. You exalt my position. You appreciate my position. And each of us esteeming the other person better than we are. Look at verse 4. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That is, you are looking at others, you are appreciating others, you are helping others, you are lifting up others, you are encouraging others, you want them to be their best, you are washing their feet, you are preparing them for a cleaner walk, you are preparing them for a more confident walk. When you wash their feet, look at verse 5, let this mind be in you. It's something from the mind. It's something that motivates you from the inside. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. As you think about him washing the disciples' feet, he had a particular mind. It's a mind of lowliness. It's a mind of humility. And it's a mind of meekness. And he says, have that mind too and be meek. Have that mind too and be lowly. Have that mind too and be gentle. Have that mind too and be humble. Look at this in verse 6. So being in the form of God, thought it not trouble to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of, tell me, a servant. Do you ever feel like that? Can you ever do that? You're always thinking of who you are. And you're always carrying your title on your forehead. And you're always walking like, you know, you are bragging. And you're, you know, moving as if uh, I'm the king in the land. But he says, why don't you now wake up? And understand what Jesus Christ has done. And what Jesus is calling us to. That he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. And he, made, he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion. As a man. He was the next word. What's the next word here? Humbled himself. Humbled himself. That means there's something you have to do. I said there's something you have to do. He did it himself. You see your brother, and as you see your brother, your thought may come be, you know, before you in your heart. I am so and so. Humble yourself and then discard that. Or you might be thinking that, you know, the other time I heard about him, I heard about her, and this is where she was, and this is what she did. Remove that and humble yourself. If I do that towards you, and you do that towards me, there will be no pride in our midst. There will be no pride in our families. There will be no pride in our house fellowship. There will be no pride in our local churches. There will be no pride in the whole church in Jesus' name. It says, I'm being found in fashion. As a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. You know what happened? Look at verse 9. Wherefore God 
has also highly exalted him. Why? Because he humbled himself. What does God do to those who humble themselves? Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you humble yourself, you don't lose anything. You gain much, much more. I said you gain much, much more. Look at what the Lord himself said about this in uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 23, reading here from verse 12. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. Whosoever shall exalt himself, tell me, shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself what's that shall be exalted i pray that that exaltation the lord will bring to every one of us in jesus name but you know salvation is very essential salvation is the number one thing a person cannot just say okay i'm going to be humble number one you cannot be humble in this sense that is according to the pattern of christ without salvation without the grace of salvation it is that grace of salvation that he gives you that actually makes you humble so the first thing is that you are born again you are a child of god and the grace of god comes to your life and that grace of god will now give you that kind of humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Were these disciples that you watched this speech, were they born again? I said, were they born again? Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 17 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. If these 70, they had the same success that the 12 disciples had had. Look at verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because, tell me, because, your, your names are written in heaven. That's the evidence they were born again. Because if they were not born again, if they were not saved, their names would not have been written in heaven. Come back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we're reading from verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world, Unto the Father, listen to this, and having loved his own. That shows they were born again. They belong to him. They were born again. They were children of God. Having loved his own. He loved them that were in the world. He loved them even to the end. Look at chapter 14, verse 17. To show us that these people were born again. So the humility we're talking about is the humility of the children of God. It's not the humility of, you know, somebody who is not born again, who is trying to be humble, who is demonstrating and pretending to be humble. It is the humility of those already born again. Chapter 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. He's talking about the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. He says, you know him. He dwells with you already, and he shall be in you. Were they born again? Yes, they were born again. Look at chapter 17, verse 8. John chapter 17, we're reading from verse 8. It says, For I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Were they believers? Yes, they were believers. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. He had separated them from the world. He had made them different from the world. These were born again people. And he says, for them, I pray for them, which thou hast given me, for they are thine. 
they are thine. They belong to God. Were they born again? They were born again. Look at verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, I have given them uh, th thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Don't have any doubt in your mind. These were born again people. These were saved people. Their sins have been forgiven. They were different from the world. And yet Jesus washed their feet and he said, The humility I've demonstrated to you, demonstrate it before each other. Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Salvation is essential. Without a definite experience of the new birth, all else is worthless. You cannot just say, I'm going to practice humility. It's good to be humble. But you know, humility without salvation is worthless and vain in the sight of the Lord. You first of all get born again. You become a disciple of Christ. You become a follower of the Lord. And then you have this virtue. It is not a mere human virtue. It's an heavenly virtue. The Lord grants us the experience of salvation through his sacrifice and then after that he gives us the example of servanthood for our acceptable service. Let true humility lead us to confession and conversion and then a Christ-like humility will lead us to consecration and condescension. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, our consecration and willing submission to the master. We're born again, we're children of God, and the Lord is going to now do something. He's teaching us a lesson, and you never say no to the Lord. You accept what the Lord is doing and what the Lord wants you to do. We're coming to John chapter 13. We're looking at it from verse 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter says unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Now you see, Jesus did not explain to them all this study we're having, all the references we're quoting to support everything and to help our understanding and knowledge. He didn't explain all that to them. He just washed their feet. He wanted them to get the lesson. He wanted the Spirit of God to interpret everything to them. And then when he came to Peter, Peter said, and he washed all the other feet. Think about that. All the other ten, that is eleven minus uh, Judas Iscariot, uh, all all the other ten, he had washed their feet. And now he came to Peter. What everybody just accepted, what everybody just uh, submitted to, Peter said, no, I'm not going to submit to this one. You see, there are people like that. They think, I have a mind of my own. I have my own opinion. We're talking about the whole body coming together and the whole body uh, becoming submissive unto the Lord. And he's saying, I have a mind of my own. I am so and so. I am such and such. But you know what? It's like uh, the food we eat. You know, sometimes uh, you have uh, cassava. You've got cassava from that uh, farm, a cassava from that farm, cassava from that farm, from different farms. And then you, have, you buy everything. As you buy them, you don't know the cassava that is from farm A, farm B, or farm C. And then you make uh, whatever you make, uh, porridge or whatever, and you mix everything together. Can you recognize which one is from farm A? Can you recognize the one from farm B? Or maybe you are the person that, you know, you like yam. And you have yam from there, yam from there, yam from there. And then you put everything together. After you have uh, boiled everything you know, and cooked everything, and you pound them. As you are taking the pounded yam, oh, I feel that this one is from the west. This one is from the east. This one is from the south. Do you feel like that? 
no, we cannot recognize anymore. And that is what the Lord is saying. He's saying that we're the body of Christ. We're all together. And as we come together, my own uh, kind of idea, my own kind of specialty, my own kind of distinction, my own kind of uh, way of thinking, my own kind of background, everything will be flushed away. Because now, we are the same in the sight of God. Well, Peter did not understand that. And Peter said, you're washing my feet. No, you will never do that. Look at verse 8. And Peter said unto him, that Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. It seems to be a little thing. It seems to be an insignificant thing. It seems to be something, okay, you don't want to wash your feet, that's all right, that's your idea, but not, not at all. Even that little thing, you know, if we show pride, that little thing, if we show resistance, that little thing, if we show I'm going to be a man of my own will, a man of my own way, a man of my own word, you're not going to wash my feet. The others may accept. I'm not a soft person like that. I am not going to accept. If you're an individual, individualistic person like that you're going to miss the kingdom of God and so G look at what Jesus said now Jesus said unto him he that is uh, if I wash thee not thou hast no part with me and Simon in verse 9 says unto him Lord not my feet only but also my hand and my head. And Jesus says unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every week, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. As we look at this, our consecration and willing submission to the Master. And let's break everything down. Number one, let's look at consecration before understanding. Consecration before understanding. You know the problem of Peter? I don't understand, therefore I will not obey. You know the problem of Peter? I don't understand that, therefore I will not submit. How could that happen? How could he say that? How could he tell us to do that? I don't understand. I've never met this kind of situation since I became born again. And since I've been following the Lord Jesus Christ, I've never been confronted with, I don't understand that, I will not do that. You see, there are people like that. They don't understand, therefore they are not going to obey. Everybody is following. Everybody is moving on. Everybody is obedient to the Lord, but they say, no, not me. And they think they are being uh, kind of spiritual. They think they are being courageous. They think they are being a, you know, a special kind of person. But you know what the Lord is looking for? He wants us to consecrate our lives to Him in total obedience, even though we don't understand, even before we understand. Look at uh, John chapter 12, verse 16. John chapter 12, verse 16. It says, These things understood not His disciples at the first. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered. You see that the others too did not understand. Jesus had never done this, and they never complained, they never rejected, never rebelled, they didn't disobey, they still obeyed. I pray that God will give you such grace. Look at Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 12. Micah chapter 4. You're not going to understand everything. You're not going to be able to analyze everything and interpret everything, understand that this is why Christ is doing that, and this is why the church is taking that decision. This is why we're having this, and this is why we're having that. But even though you don't understand, he wants us to obey. He wants us to submit. It. Submission, consecration, obedience, even before you understand. Look at Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 12. Mark chapter 4, verse 12. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord. 
How would you know the thoughts of the Lord? It says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so if you wait until you understand, now I understand, now I understand, and now I want to do it. You're coming too late. You're coming too late. Before you understand, go ahead and be obedient to the Lord. It says, but they know, they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them at the sheaves into the floor. Let, let's see the example of somebody that obeyed like that and followed through like that, even before understanding, before knowing the details of why God has said what he was saying. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out, into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed what did he do tell me out aloud he obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went he went out not knowing whither he went that's why the bible calls abraham the father of faith the faithful friend of God because he obeyed even though he didn't understand, even though he didn't know where he was going. And the Lord is saying the same thing. When the word of God comes to you, there is but one thing to do. Tell me just obey. Just obey. Just obey. is the way God's way. When that word comes to you, one thing to do just obey. Proverbs, I'm reading from chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Lean not unto thine own understanding. You may not understand all the doctrines of the Bible. You may not understand understand about the rapture, about uh, the great tribulation, about the second coming, about all the details of eschatology. But look at what the Lord is telling us. As you look at the word of God and say, this is what he has commanded, you will not lean onto your own understanding and you'll be, ob you'll be obedient in Jesus' name. Waiting to obey Christ until we understand all his actions and all his commandments only reveals lack of consecration. I'm waiting. I still want to understand. I'm not rebellious. I just want to understand. It shows lack of consecration. It shows lack of sanctification. The Adamic nature is still there. The depravity is still there. And the self-will is still there. I can't obey now. I can't follow what I don't understand. But look at it in the word of God. I don't know why God can command that. I don't know why God will tell us to do something like that. There's no sanctification. There's no circumcision of heart. When you are saying, I'm waiting to understand. I'm waiting to understand. Many times you come to the Bible study and then we're reading the passage. Now I understand. How about yesterday you need to understand? How about last month you need to understand? Would you not obey the Lord just because you didn't understand uh, two months ago? And then when we don't obey like that, it is that we lack honor for Christ. Honor for Christ. We're not honoring Christ. He's greater than I am. He's more knowledgeable than I am. He knows the way. I don't know the way. And because he knows knows the way and because he is Christ says my Lord is my Savior therefore I honor him if we don't uh, obey because I don't understand it means that you don't have humble exaltation of Christ it means you don't you don't have crucifixion of self self is sitting on the throne of your, of your heart and that self has not been crucified because self is there and self is asserting its authority I will not do that except I understand. You see, when you are like that, you don't have self crucified. You don't have total freedom from depravity. You still have depravity inside. That's the thing that is rebelling on the inside. I will not obey. I will not allow that. I will not submit except I understand. And then you don't have heavenly mindedness. When you're saying, I'm sitting down here, everybody may obey. That's, that's them. Everybody may comply. That's them. Everybody 
everybody may submit as them, but me here, this is where I stand. I'm a man of my word, a man of my way, a man of my will. Once I said, I will not, I will not. My friend, it means that you are not heavenly minded. And that's the problem of Peter here. Let's come back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 8. It says, Peter says unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Never. Not even today. And if you come back tomorrow, I'm not going to allow you to do it tomorrow. And if you come back next week, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be a follower. I'm going to be a disciple. But never will, you, will I allow you to wash my feet. My feet is mine. And you don't have a right to do anything with my feet here except I give you the permission. Think about a disciple talking to the master like that. And think about Peter of all people talking to Jesus like that. Thou shalt never wash my feet. Are there some people there in the church that although you are part of this church, you don't go to any other church, you don't say that other church, this is your church, but you've made up your mind, you say, whatever they preach, whatever they say, allow them to preach, and whatever other people do, allow them to do whatever they're going to do, but me, this will never happen. They'll never see me on that road of obedience. They'll never see me in that pathway of submission. They'll never see me bending myself so low that I'm going to allow this. No, I'm not going to allow this. I'll attend all the retreats. I'll attend all the meetings. I'll attend everything. And I'm going to hear everything they are preaching. I love the church. This is my church. Just this one thing. This will never happen. You see, when you are like that, it's like this a person uh, that is saying, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And then Jesus said in verse 8, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. This is uh, what we call the condemnation of an unbending will. The condemnation of an unbending will, his will will not bend. It was an unyielding will. I'm not going to yield to this. And, uh, and Peter is like this. You know, sometimes you need to look at your life and look at some peculiarities you have. And those peculiarities, take it to the cross and crucify that thing so that all this uh, individualism, all this egoistic uh, attitude, you're going to brush that away from your life. Look at Matthew chapter Chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and I'm reading here from verse 21. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it says, From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, they shall not happen unto thee. You see, this is a peculiar weakness of uh, Peter. He didn't understand that Jesus Christ had to die for the salvation of the whole world. Even Caiaphas eventually understood that. And Caiaphas said, it is expedient that, one, expedient that one will die. And so the whole nation will not perish. And Peter, he walked on the water, but look at his attitude. Peter, he was at the Mount of Transfiguration, but look at his attitude. Peter, he was the one that is first mentioned. Look at the list of all the apostles. The first of them mentioned Simon Peter. And after that, James, John, and Andrew. And then go to Mark, and they mentioned their name, Simon Peter. Peter number one, James, John, and Andrew will follow. Come to the Acts of the Apostles, Simon, Peter, and then James and John will follow. But, look at this. Thou shalt never wash my feet. Not so, Lord. If you have a peculiarity that is going to cut you away from heaven, even though you are an important person, he was an important person, no doubt, and he was an important part of the uh, members of, uh, you know, the team of the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt, and yet that peculiar situation, I'm standing on what I stand for. I'm rejecting what I reject. This will never happen. Why don't you bend? 
Why don't you surrender? Why don't you submit? Because you see, this thing may cost you your eternal life. I'm coming to uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 13. Acts chapter 10. We're reading from verse, tell me your verse. Verse 13, look at this. And, and, there, and, and there came a voice unto him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, tell me. He knew it was the Lord talking. That's why I said, not so, Lord. And that's a contradiction in terms. It says, you are Lord, you are master, you are all in all, you are my king, you are my savior, you are the final authority. The Lord has the final say, but this one you are telling me to do, not so. Not so, Lord. You see, that kind of character coming from Matthew, that is Matthew chapter 16, and then we see that in John chapter 13, and now we, after the Holy Ghost had come upon him, after he had even healed the sick, and a lot of other things that happened, the Lord is now saying, rise, kill and eat. He didn't even ask for explanation, just said peremptorily, finally, categorically, not so, Lord. You see, if you are like that, it's a terrible blemish in your life that you will not condescend and you will not consecrate and you will not yield yourself until all the details are proved to you. Heaven must come and kneel before you and try to plead with you. Please, why don't you obey? And Christ must leave the right hand side of the Father and he must come to you personally and say, Peter, how about this now? I give you this, I give you that and you control this, you control that and then I'm sending you now please and be pleading what kind of disciple will that be and what kind of life are you going to live when every time you are saying not so Lord not so Lord and then let's come to verse 14 there Peter said not so Lord and then he says I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean uh-huh you are cleaner than the Lord, you are brighter than the Lord, and you are higher than the Lord, and the Lord from heaven is saying, this is what you do, and now you know much more than the Lord, and you, are the, you know much more than the author of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at uh, verse uh, 15, uh, and the voice speak to him again the second time, what God has cleansed that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel uh, was received up again into heaven. But you see the challenge, uh, you know, we're talking about. Jesus now told him, Peter, okay, you're always like that. You're a man of your word, a man of your will, and a man of your backbone, and you are standing, and you never bend. Well, look at this. It's in John chapter 13, verse 8. John chapter 13, verse 8. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. If I wash thee not, if you refuse firmly and finally and totally and completely, you have no a part with me. What does that mean? The consequence of seeming little acts of self-will are eternally painful. Number one, it means the loss of partnership with Christ. You have no part with me. This little thing, that's what it appears to be. You are going, not going to allow this. Your will must overrule in every situation. All right. The thing is, you do not have any part of me. Number two, it will be loss of acceptance and recognition by Christ. You have no part with me, I won't recognize you anymore. You have no part with me, I won't accept you anymore. It means the loss of benefits of conversion. You were converted, you were born again, no doubt. And uh, you walked on the sea, no doubt. All the benefits of conversion you are going to lose because you have no part with me. Number four, that you are going to lose the previous promise of reigning with Christ. Ye are they that have followed me up till this time. And you are going to reign on the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, if you don't allow this little thing, you are going to miss and you are going to lose. You are going to forfeit 
the precious promise and the previous promise of reigning with Christ. Not only that, you are going to lose future revelation and impartation by Christ. I'm not going to count you as part of my people anymore. You don't have any part with me. And the further revelation and the further impartation I want to bring upon my people, you are going to lose that forever. And then you are going to miss uh, heaven eventually. Because if you don't have any part with me, I'm not going to allow you to get to heaven and have your self-will and your firm will standing like that against what the Lord had said. Let's come back now to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 9. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He now realized that this, this wasn't a little thing. And this wasn't something you can just push aside. And so he now said, okay, I give the permission. Any, any part you want to wash my feet, go ahead. My hands, go ahead. My head, go ahead. Jesus saith unto him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. But is clean every week. And ye are clean, but not all. When he said not all, he was talking about Judas Iscariot. I pray you will not be Judas Iscariot. He said that Judas, there's no, there's no talk even about that one. Ye are not talking about not all. That other one is gone with the devil. Is gone to the point of no return. I pray you will not go to the point of no return. He was a disciple, he was following up, he was even the treasurer, and he was, uh, you know, holding the bag. He was an important person amidst the team of the disciples of Christ, but because of the love of money and covetousness, he went to the point of no return, no grace anymore, no mercy anymore, no love anymore, nothing. He's gone, he are not all clean. I pray you'll be clean. Yeah. Where is the person I'm talking about? You'll be clean in Jesus' name. Once you submit your will to the Lord, totally, and you say, Lord, here am I. He says, now, uh, the carnal pretenders in religion be give a partial obedience to God's word. Those who are truly converted and consecrated to Christ, they obey in all things without pretense or without counting any of God's word as unimportant. Sometimes you hear some people say, well, you know, I'm a member of this church. I believe everything. The major, major, major doctrines I believe. But you know, this minor one, this little one, now, who gives you the liberty to say the word of God is a little one? Who gives you the liberty, the authority to say the teaching of the word of God? You see the chapter, you see the verse. In this church, we don't tell you to do anything. We're going to read to you and show you where it is. And we'll show you even many references. Before we say, go and do this, we'll show you many references. And yet you have uh, the kind of um, audacity to say this little one, that little one. Look at this one. It's like this little one. Just like this minor one. Just like just washing the feet. I accept everything. No adultery, no fornication, and uh, no polygamy, no this, and no that. All that one I accept. But this little one washing the feet, there's no little part of the word of God. I said there's no little part of the word of God. And if we have grace, the Lord is going to give us the grace to be obedient all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming now to point number three. Point number three, the call to willing self-sacrifice like the master. The call to a willing self-sacrifice like the master. We're reading from John chapter 13. John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 12. So, after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and, and had taken his garments and was set down again. He said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is uh, said greater than he that sent him. If he know these things, tell me, if he know these things, 
V6, is that singular or plural? Tell me. It's not just talking about washing the feet now. It's saying, I've shown you many examples of humility, of lowliness, of meekness, of love, of sacrifice, of self-denial. I've shown you all these examples. And if, if you know these things in the plural, happy are you. If you do them, I pray that the blessedness of obedience will come upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at what he's telling us in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You see what he's saying? He said, don't just be like this is me and this is who I am. Now you are born again. If you are born again, learn of Christ. He's lowly and he's meek. And he's saying that as, as you put on that character, you'll find rest for your soul. We're looking at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, we're reading from verse 11. Luke chapter 14, we're reading from verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Whosoever exalteth himself, I'm higher than the word of God. I'm higher than that they are teaching. I'm higher than those little, little things. I'm higher than, you know, just saying yes, sir, yes, sir. I'm higher than just saying, okay, I agree, I agree. No, I'm a top person. I know, I know I'm a top person. I know I'm a difficult person. I know I'm a difficult member. And you just have to agree with me. I'm difficult. No, you are proud. Not that you are difficult. You are a man of a selfish interest. You are a man that says, I never listen to anybody. I'm higher than everybody else. Not that you are difficult. How difficult are you? You are not difficult, but you are self-centered. You are not difficult, but you are a person of your mind that says, I hear the word of God, I will not obey. That's not being difficult. That's being proud. And it says in verse 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself, tell me, shall be exalted. We're looking at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 23. It tells us in verse 23, He says unto them all, He said unto them, how many of them? Unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Don't deny the word of God. Deny yourself. Don't deny that little sin. Deny yourself. Don't deny Christ of washing your feet. Deny yourself. Don't deny the example that Jesus has laid down. Don't deny humility and lowliness. But it is yourself you deny. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Look at Luke chapter 6 verse 46. Luke Chapter 6, verse 46. It says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You say, He is my Lord, He is my Savior, He is my sanctifier, He is the King of kings. Okay, we hear you. But why call him Lord, Lord, and do not the things which he has said? Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, verse 47. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. Here it tells us, verse 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. The people that are bragging, I'm a man of my will, a man of my word, a man of my own direction, what I said I will not do, I will not do, but you see the word of God, you see the will of God. And it says, he that knows his master's will, his Lord's will, and he does not prepare himself to do his master's will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. I pray you'll escape the judgment of God. Amen. Look at verse 48. But he that knew not and did, com and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For Unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of, of him, they will ask the more. Uh, the Lord is uh, telling us that he appreciates and he loves and he commands a humble heart. 
a humble disposition, humility coming from within, humble disposition, humble attitude in the midst of the children of God. Don't be the odd man out. Don't be the odd woman out. We we'll say that, you know, now somebody is preparing for marriage. My brother, others too have gotten married in this church. And we have told them this is the way of the Lord, but that is the way of the world. And other people have complied. Didn't you see those who married last month and then last year and all this? And now it comes to your turn. Why are you the only one that is saying, no, I don't agree with that. Why don't you agree with that? He that's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That's what he was saying. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because if you love the world, you are not of God. The love of the Father is not him. That's what we are saying. We are saying, he that is a giving to pleasure is dead while he lives. That's what we are saying. The word of God is what we are reading to you. And everybody is complying. Look at Jesus Christ. He washed the feet here. washed the feet here. Nobody said anything. Nobody raised any alarm. And now he came to Peter of all people. And sometimes, you know, my brother, you might be an important person in the house of God and now your child is going to get married and everybody has been following my brother, my sister everybody has been following now it comes to your turn and because of who you are in the church because of position, because of money because of whatever, because of popularity no, this time I will not accept that my brother, who are you? my sister, who are you? when everybody is complying you must have the same heart of the same attitude and the same disposition humble behavior that's what god is looking for humble self-sacrifice that's what god is looking for he's looking for humble service humble obedience humble self-evaluation that you don't promote yourself exalt yourself above that which you are that's what the lord is asking for and genuine salvation genuine sanctification will give us this kind of humble heart and i pray that we'll be humble in jesus name you see, the Lord himself wants us to just bow down and bend low to the word of God so that it's not like, you know, this is me and this is you. Let's see, even Peter himself, not Peter realized. Look at what Peter is now saying. We're looking at First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. It says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. This Peter now, he has learned the lesson. I will learn the lesson. I said I will learn the lesson. He has now, you know, he's now understood. The grace of God is uh, come to him more. And the strength of the Lord has come to him. And the light, the light has come to him more. And the necessity of being obedient, he has not seen that. And he's now seen likewise and passing it on to you. I pray you'll receive it. It says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, how many of us? All. Tell me out aloud. All. Are you there? Yes. Are you one of them? Yes. Is the rich among them? Yes. Is, are the women among them? Yes. Are the men among them? Yes. Are our pastors, overseers among them? Yes. And you members that said yesterday, whatever they say, I will not accept. Are you now among us? I can't hear my people. Yeah. The Lord will give all of us grace in Jesus' name. Yea, yeah. all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Look at verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I pray I will see you promoted. Yeah. I'll see you exalted in Jesus' name. Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Giveth grace to the humble. Look at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. He shall lift you up. Amen. Let him do the lifting up, but you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. We have learned a lot uh, today, and I pray that what we have learned will be implanted in every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate into the city. We're going to the heavenly city. You will be there. I will be there. Just telling us, blessed are they that do his will and do his commandments. And what he has taught us today on humility, on lowliness, as well as condescension and bending low and being able to obey the word of God, he wants us to carry that out. And you'll not be the odd man out, and you'll not be the odd woman person there. you say, Lord, I accept. Lord, I believe. And Lord, I'm going to be obedient to your word. And the Lord grants you grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer on what we've learned. This heavenly virtue of uh, your humble servanthood. That God will give you grace. You'll be obedient to the word of God.